Hello everyone, and welcome back to my colonization series in Kerbal Space Program 0.25. In the previous episode, we put a station in orbit around Kerbin, and in this episode, I want to try and send some assets over to the moon, uh, especially the lunar surface. And here you see a lighting array, and you can see how well it lights the VAB, and in fact, some of the terrain outside. And uh, so it, it's got... Uh, it's got uh, quite nifty features, including the ability to uh, get nice and high so that I can cover more ground. So uh, we, we're putting the infernal robotics to minimal use, I mean uh, basic hydraulic use. And uh, it's got uh, auxiliary solar panels, but uh, my hope is that it will be able to drill for carbonite and convert carbonite using this portable carbonite generator in order to produce the electric power needed to run the lights. Uh, remember, we don't have RTGs, so my problem was how do I power the lighting array when the, the base on the moon is in the dark? And so that's, that's basically my hope that this will be able to drill for carbonite and thereby, thereby uh, power this, but I'm not entirely sure this is a good way to hook up everything in order to do that. So that's something we have to test. I mean, I don't know if sticking the gener the generator only had a radial, uh, really, really could only be placed radially. So I had this problem, but it's very light. This is a portable carbonite generator as opposed to uh, the larger ones. So it is light and doesn't unbalance it too much, I think. We'll find out. Now, for a light payload like this, it's only 2.8 tons uh, altogether. It's got its own landing apparatus. It won't need to be carried down by the by the orange or the pumpkin. Um, so it's just got to land on its own. It's got a Rocket Max uh, 48.7S down there. And uh, so, but this is only 2.8 tons even with its own fuel. So the key thing was to build a new launcher. And so let me introduce you to that once I get this back on. And make sure the fairings don't come off right when we try to launch. That would be a bad thing. All right, so here is the the stage that will get it to the moon, and it's just another uh, Rock Max 48.7S in here. Uh, nothing too surprising. However, I should open it up because there are other features. Uh, in particular, oh, uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so there's a probe core here. You can see parachutes and a reaction wheel, which means this stage down here is recoverable. And my hope is that it is recoverable from orbit. So this is uh, going to be going to orbit. And you remember I tried to recover the Yakko stage from orbit in the previous episode, but it's very large. And I guess uh, maybe that's a little bit too ambitious to try, and to try to recover from orbit with deadly reentry and all. So I decided to try something a little bit smaller to see how it works out. And so that's the plan with this. But the real interesting part is the bottom of it. Uh-oh. I, I see things have gotten a little bit too interesting. That's not right. Okay. There's, there's a little bit of attachment problems with these procedural fuel tanks, uh, procedural parts tanks, but, uh, but I, I can deal with that. Okay, so you'll, you'll note that this is called the Sparrow 2, and you'll wonder what the Sparrow 1 was. Well, the Sparrow 1 was when I put uh, Rockmax 48.7S's on these outer pods, and I found out that it doesn't have enough thrust, and I couldn't get the delta V necessary to get everything into orbit, not with a 2.8 ton payload. It could get a 1.8 ton payload. I uh, tested the numbers out using a dummy payload on top to see what its capacity would be. But then I hit upon the idea to use tweak scale to resize the LVT-30. So there's an LVT-45 in the center here, standard size. But then we've got the LVT-30s, and I've scaled them down to 62.5 centimeters. This means that they get a thrust of about 50-ish. And uh, which is more than the Rock Max 48.7S is 30-ish, and so that allowed this to have the thrust weight ratio to get off the pad with the delta V it needs to get into orbit. So that's why we've got tweak scaled LVT 30s on the bottom there. But sometimes the nodes don't work out because sometimes I think it wants to have the nodes that come with the LVT 30 instead of the node that it has when it's rescaled. Um, these are the landing leg pods. There you go. See, uh, LT pod landing assembly. I 
think it comes with the USI survivability pack, though I'm not 100% sure. Uh, it says here, moving parts expert group, working group for working parts. Um, so yeah, it's sort of in the middle of uh, other more standard parts, itinerant service container, uh, procedural parts. These are procedural parts down here. Um, and I'd say these are near future parts. So I don't know which uh, I should get one of those part, but I don't I don't really have that much trouble finding my parts, um, so I don't have one of those part catalog kind of mods in here. But yeah, so that's what those are, and so that will be useful. It this I think this will have to land on land. Uh, we really can't bring this down over over water, so that's going to have to be a thing. Okay, without further ado, let's try and get this uh, lighting tower over to the moon to our base, specifically. We can't just get it anywhere and uh, see if we can get some light on that situation. Okay, it is daylight here, and uh, let's turn off the lights. We don't need all of that. Quite impressive. Okay, throttle up, SAS on. Let's get uh, Smart ASS ready. And, well, looks like all systems go. Launch. One of the neat things about uh, doing uh, tweak scaled engines is that you can see that the plume of the, the smaller outer engines is just as large as the plume for the center LVT-45. In other words, the plumes didn't get uh, resized, so so you can uh, get a pretty neat effect, uh, more realistic engine effect by tweak scaling them down, and uh, then you'll get uh, more appropriate looking plume for the rockets. Though, of course, in this case, because uh, we've got uh, these tiny little guys, it doesn't quite work out. But uh, if you put one of these tiny little guys on an appropriately sized rocket then I think the plume would look a little bit more appropriate for that rocket. And so you could tweak scale down something something else, like, uh, like a mainsail. Maybe that would work out. Just a theory. I don't know. Uh, the, of course, with mods, there are better ways of getting the right plume effects, I think. Hot rockets being the first that comes to mind, but I think there's another one out nowadays. I think uh, that I saw another one that to work with real solar system in the realism overhaul thread. Ah, nice cloudy day. I like it when there's clouds out. Uh, you've got a little bit of a wiggle on this rocket. You can see that there. A little bit of a rocking motion. Um, just for you to know, the fuel is being fed both into and out of these little pods. So, uh, so yeah, that's that's the way it works there. I'm just sort of following the progress vector down, trying to stay on top of it though. We'll probably shift to below it once we get to about 40 degrees. Looking good so far, though. I'm sort of surprised that this whole thing hasn't already ripped apart uh, down here. Something falling off the landing pods, these little pods carrying the uh, additional engines. You know, those connections are always rife for, for instance, Spare Mirror Space to make a fuss about them or just Kerberos Space Program glitching out on them. Now I do have the outer engines action group, so once we get to a little bit higher than this, I'm gonna shut them down and just let the center engine take over. I think this is good. 
Uh oh. Uh, action grouping didn't work. Darn. Okay, well they're the same kind of engine. It shouldn't make a difference. I'll just uh, throttle down actually. It looks like I only action grouped one of them instead of the whole symmetry group. Okay, I think uh, I want to, well, let me drop the fairings a little bit higher. I want to save the fuel, right? It's not just the fuel to get up into orbit, we need some fuel to deorbit this thing. Okay, I think I'll let go of them. Looks safe. Still sort of rocking back and forth though. Maybe that's the payload, maybe that's the rocket. Not too sure. I think I should rename this. Maybe we should call it Rocker 1 or something. Okay, I had to pause a little bit there for a noise disruption and we ended up in an apoapsis of 87 kilometers, periapsis of 77 kilometers, which is fine. We have about 188 meters per second worth of fuel, which should be enough to deorbit. I did some deorbit tests uh, over the weekend so that I would be able to deorbit these things a little bit more precisely, so hopefully that will work out. But for now, let's separate our payload. Okay. And uh, activate the payload's engine. Have it thrust forward just a little bit. There we go. I won't uh, send it on its way just yet. I want to see if we can deorbit. Okay, get back to the thing. Yes, deorbit this. And so, what I uh, tested for, where is the KSC? Now this is a problem for me because I didn't uh, put a little uh, marker at the KSC. I think this is it. Yeah. Okay, and uh, so I was actually measuring from the from the Korean shaped peninsula as I unfortunately call it. Really the test this time is to see whether we can get through deadly re-entry, not whether we can hit the KSC. But while I'm doing it, I might as well do it properly. So, we're going to retro burn on the opposite side of the planet from the Korean shaped peninsula. And uh, try, uh, at this orbit, I think the best thing would be to go for 34 kilometers. Depending on your orbit, it will be different. By a 100 kilometer orbit, circular, it ends up being something like uh, 30 kilometers and we're assuming standard blunt objects here okay smart ASS is off we've got only two hours with a battery life here so we have to make it down on the first orbit otherwise we're not gonna have much control over this thing Now nah, it depends on whether I've really got this over where I want it to be. I'm surprised it looked pretty bright outside when we launched from the KSC, but now the KSC is totally in the dark. Huh. Okay, anyway, uh, we'll try this. Hopefully we'll at least get onto the continents properly. There's also a thing, my testing was uh, completely in uh, stock. So I didn't do it with uh, firm aerospace. I should install trajectories in here, really. Uh, but I, I haven't uh, used trajectories much. I could use MechJeb in the hope that, but MechJeb, I need the FAR plugin for MechJeb because right now MechJeb's trajectories are for stock atmosphere, not for, not for this. So uh, let's say show landing predictions. It says around here. Now it says I'm gonna land at 47 west, okay? Just keep that in mind. But I, I'm pretty sure what's gonna happen is different from that. Okay, these are at the launch pad, so that's where I want to hit. 
Now we're hitting the atmosphere here. Let's uh, have Smart ASS take us retrograde. This thing is very tall. So what happens is it's uh, in the atmosphere really, really, really has to be going retrograde. Otherwise it'll start flipping out. Now, uh, one thing I'm hoping for is that the engines are going to heat shield this. Also that these little uh, pods contain the landing gear are properly heat shielded. Um, you can see that they, they basically, with the between the engines and the pods that are carrying the landing gear, they basically have the whole thing covered at the bottom here. I also, uh, you noticed, uh, carefully put the parachutes in a position where they are blocked by the entire bulk of this thing. I did not attach them to the outside of here because that's just a recipe for getting them all burned off. I think a parachute should do. You see we're at 8 tons here. I think they can carry a ton apiece easily. Okay, descending fast. Though not that fast. I've got physical time warp on. Our landing prediction is predictably changing as we go. Okay, I don't think I need Smart ASS to help us stay retrograde any longer. And I do want to foster this kind of rotation just to make sure if there is some sort of heat imbalance between the top side and bottom side that uh, the parts get evened out on that. Okay, here we go. Uh, I should take time warp off just so that the calculations don't go all awry. We have overheating on the outer engines, the small ones. Maybe a little bit more rotation. Well, it doesn't matter. It seems like they're all overheating evenly. Well, if they're the only thing that explodes, that, that won't be horrible. Uh, it'll be quite a setback though. Uh, getting quite hot here. What's the temperature on them? Uh, 800 and... well that's pretty... that's pretty low isn't it? 870 only? Oh. Uh, the one to 1200. And now the overheating disappears? Well, they're still attached. Ah, well, I can't argue with that. Um, still heating more. Really, did anything? No. Uh, no? No, nothing got destroyed there. Huh. I don't think I put a good little uh, marker on the KSC, but I've got some debris there, I think. I don't know whether this one is debris I should be looking at or that one. I think it's that one that's the real debris. So about 82 kilometers away. Well, aside from that weird overheating on the outer engines, maybe, maybe it's a tweak scale thing. I don't know. Um, but aside from that, we look fine. We should be on the cooling end of things by now. Yeah, it's cooling down. Okay, so the standard parameters are what I'm going with, and that's uh, we go below Mach 1 before deploying the parachutes. I've updated real shoots, and I thought about doing another parachute test at the beginning of this episode, but this will be a parachute test. And according to the change log, it said that uh, the parachutes now deploy on the first, first spacebar press. So. But it seems like it's already lumped them into the same stage, so I don't know if that's really there's really any difference right now. Okay, I'm hoping that's the KSC. So I can't see any lights. Though no, though no, that's the that debris is the launch tower stuff. So yeah. I think it's safe to deploy parachutes. Okay, sounded like they went. Where's my sp skybox? I mean, I should have at least 
the Milky Way to give us some background. Oh, I guess it's the clouds. The clouds again. Oh, there's the there's the KSC. Okay, that's good. Let's get landing gear down. Okay, parachutes are deployed. We're 5.6 kilometers away from the KSC, which is excellent. So even though uh, I test did my testing in stock and we we're in far over here, it seems like my numbers work out. So that's interesting. I guess KSC and far are very different uh, when you're at uh, low velocities or lower in the atmosphere, but when you're in high velocities or higher in the atmosphere, maybe they're a little bit more convergent. Okay, five meters per second on our descent rate. I think that's safe. I don't think I need to use throttle in order to get us a softer landing. We'll see. Oh, oh, it's toppling, it's toppling. Ah! Ah! Okay, so we'll need a soft landing speed. Well, the, the the core is here, and actually the the engines are all there. It's just uh, the center fuel tank is not. Okay, well let's let's recover this. Probably if we uh, landed right on the runway, it would have worked out, but it looks like we ended up on a slope. So, yeah, uh, but uh, pretty good. I mean, we survived the uh, Delhi re-entry. We came very close to the KSC, under five kilometers. Yeah, I think that will work out. Uh, for, for light payloads to the moon, well, first we have to get our payload to the moon, but I think uh, uh, the situation is much easier when it comes to actually making a transfer right now. But, uh, yeah, I think we are in a good position with this... Uh, I don't know if we should call it Sparrow 2 or Rocker 1, uh, <laughs> considering what I was doing on the way up. But, uh, yeah, uh, maybe using a little bit of thrust on uh, when we were descending, maybe bringing it down to 3 meters per second or something like that would have ensured that we actually got it even on the slope. Okay, now let's turn to the main mission with the light tower. Oh, I came into the tracking station to uh, turn to the light tower and also perhaps retrieve this little thing. Um, let, let's let's recover this. Okay, didn't give any dialogue. Um, I think this is the light tower, but we've got all these other ones: Wilton's Anomaly, Scott's Dawn, and Site One L R A. And I think that has to do with um, the fine print mod. I added the fine print mod already. And I think that's what's going on here. These are uh, mission locations for the fine print mod. So uh, sometime or another I'm going to have to pop into the mission control and see what kind of missions we've got there. But for now let's take care of the light tower. Well with the light tower I don't think we need to be in the dark. There it is. Uh, though we only have nine minutes of electric charge with all the lights on like this. Uh, I'll get solar panels out. Definitely need them for transit. Okay, standard transfer, 49 kilometers, no biggie. And uh, our transfer stage is going to be disposable. So it's, it's just a tiny little stage here. This little uh, procedural fuel tank. And uh, basically about, a, about one, <clears throat> excuse me, 1 1.2 tons worth of fuel there. And then the LV, uh, the, no, the Rocket Max uh, 487S there. Okay. Boop, boop, boop. Stabilize. Duke. Better hope that this carbonite drilling stuff works. Probably need the RTGs anyway, but still, be nice if it worked out. Okay. I think we're ready to make our transfer. This thing is very maneuverable. All right. Ah, a little bit late actually. So after this, I'm going to be sending over a, a Kerbitat, a uh, little habitat module to the base. So that will be the main habitat module, as opposed to right now our two Kerbals on the moon are in the emergency habitat. 
and I expect that we'll try to transfer them to the Kerbatat uh, once we've got that set up. And of course that'll be going over on the Yakko and Wacko stages. Okay, there we go, 49 kilometers. And we are on our way. Let's just... Uh, electric charge seems fine right now. Let's make the journey. And I'll just head for periapsis in order to make the burn. Okay, uh, 40 by 54 is fine. Let's find our landing location. It's got a little bit of an inclination to it, I know. Yeah, it's it's a little bit, a little bit higher up there. Just and well, no, it's uh, fully on the nighttime side. Let's see, not rover alpha. There we go. CCC. The command. Well, the colony control center. I want to say command and control center, but not quite. Seems pretty good. Go to surface speed here. We're pretty much lined up. I'll wait till a little bit later to turn on the lights. This is somewhat critical. Get the landing gear down though. Got one more minute and 40 seconds on the lights. No more battery power after that. Yeah, I'm just going to turn one light on. That might be the wrong light. <laughs> Two lights. Uh, okay, there we go. Okay, we're on the ground. Well, I had fuel and I used fuel. What can I say? Okay, let's try and get this whole uh, carbonite extraction thing underway see if we will have electric charge for these lights or not. Okay, uh, no, not retract drill. Let me go with the other drill that's got to do its whole retraction animation. Okay, extract carbonite. Okay, carbonite is being extracted, going into the tank. Start generator. Yes, we have carbonite generation. Um, lights can come on. Yes, we see our our other carbonite miner there, our main carbonite miner. The the colony control center is a little bit far out of range, but 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 we haven't uh, extended the light tower yet. I think that's the limit of it. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, that's pretty good. Uh, the Yeah, the colony control center is a little bit out of range. We can truck it in. We've got that tug. This thing looks pretty stable. It's, uh, it's positively refueling with electric charge even in the dark. I think we're good. Yep, I think we're good. Let's shut down the engine just to make sure no, no hijinks ensue. Okay, so this first uh, first thing is complete and now I am going to be looking forward to launching a, a Kerbatat here. Though I think we should, well, we, if we launch we'll probably end up when this is on the daylight side anyway. So might as well just try and launch. Why is it all seeming like only half the lights are on? I think it's because we've got too many lights for it to render. I think uh, there's, there's like a 8, you, know, you, you can set in the settings, but I think we're on 8 pixel light count and it's only rendering eight of the lights uh, specifically but then it's casting the general light ray if you will for the rest of them. I, I think it's alright, I, I don't mind. Uh, probably better not to overload it with uh, lights to render otherwise we're gonna have other problems. Okay so uh, back to the VAB. Very interesting. So when I tried to return to the Space Center, the game crashed. So I decided to come back in and check on our little, our little uh, 
light tower, and it's still drilling for carbonite, still got its electric charge, so all is well. Except the lunar tre well, lunar texture here has turned to that wooden texture that I've seen before. Uh, there's something weird about the way tech. Uh, it, it was clearly not this. I don't think it was this texture once we landed, was it? I think there's something weird going on with the moon's texture sometimes. But anyway, uh, the point is that this is safe and maybe I can turn to the space center safely this time. Okay, so here's the Kerbatat on the Yakko and Wacko. I've made sure that it has a reaction wheel this time. It's got its own uh, command module so that it can be controlled, I believe. A uh, docking port to uh, attach to the pumpkin. Uh, lights, more lights. I thought uh, they need more lights. I even added solar panels here. So it, it's quite controllable. It's got one of the little inflatable habitat modules here and otherwise a uh, place to attach things there. Uh, one of these sort of docking facilities and a docking facility for the tug. Remember that's important and that has to be in line with the wheels. You can see the wheelbase that we have going there. Um, this is fuel for the pumpkin. So once this docks up with the pumpkin, then the pumpkin will grab the fuel from here in order to refuel itself to bring it back down. The transfer stage is the wacko stage, uh, though the wacko stage will also have to help out with getting to orbit. Let's see the stats here. Uh, so uh, this is going to be short of orbit before uh, dumping the yakko stage, which will we will try to recover. We've got the parachutes and we've got the new flotation devices. It'll definitely be ditching in the water. Well, let me say not not definitely. Maybe it'll hit an island or that peninsula somehow. But uh, yeah, we're going to be trying to retrieve it and seeing how that works out now with the flotation devices. Remember, we've got the double-staged parachutes, lots of parachutes working for us to keep this good. Uh, somebody wondered uh, why I didn't put uh, parachutes over here or uh, elsewhere because, of course, uh, we've got different parts and uh, as we deployed parachutes, uh, it produces uh, a lot of torque, of course ripping things apart is likely. And of course the reason is that if I even put one parachute over here, the lever arm of that will uh, will uh, end up uh, unbalancing everything. The center mass is so low, it's the center mass is right here. Okay, and uh, I would need some sort of parachute on the opposite side, which there there is no opposite side. So either that or I'd, I'd need multiple parachutes on this side of the center of mass right so that's why there are no parachutes out here and uh, so yes we do risk uh, this thing falling apart due to stress because of the multiple parts but there I have a tank size limit I would like to make all of this one tank but I can't do that because of the tank size limit alright so that's that's the situation Otherwise, everything is a, uh, it should be very similar to the colony control center thing, except we've added more controllability to the, to the, this Kerbatat module, so that it'll be easier to dock with it. Uh, I think we've got a controller in here and batteries, yeah. Okay, so all is good there. Right. Yep, let's, uh, oh, uh. I have to remember to uh, action group the Sparrow's other engines. We had an issue with that, though I guess uh, turning off the other engines doesn't really matter that much. Uh, we can just throttle down. It'd only matter if they were different engines than the... Uh, had a different ISP. But, uh, yeah, all the radio inflatables are, are action grouped to zero. Okay, let's launch. Up, I made a mistake. We ended up with Jib and Bill in here. No, uh, we're, not, we're not transferring Jib and Bill like this. Let me take this, uh, let me just uh, recover vessel. We we want this, I might have one Kerbal in, but not these two. Oh, I just remembered, I, uh, I actually uh, have not repaired my destroyed astronaut complex. Let's do that. Okay, now it's all nice and repaired. Now, let me uh, select which Kerbal I want to send out. I am going to send out uh, John Gas Kerman. Yes, he will uh, occupy the Kerbatat for now. Okay, and I think now we're ready to go. Okay, Valiant John Gas Kerman will be taking the risk for us here. I'm going to time warp to... Oh, physical time warp, that's not right. 
Uh, huh. Okay, we are in daylight. Now, the, the first stage is going to have to be recovered through FMRS. This is the first time I'm trying out FMRS version 0.3. I'm arming it now. Don't worry, I uh, zipped up the save after getting the light tower onto the moon. So just in case uh, something goes wrong with FMRS, we can revert to uh, that point. Okay, uh, but uh, John Gas, uh, let's hope that uh, John Gas is all right. Okay, uh, yep. Let's light these guys and get to work. I did put extra food, water, and oxygen on the curvitat, but that's not really what I'd consider enough. It's a good idea to keep an eye on our life support. Right now, John Gas himself has got 78 days worth. The emergency habitat has 349 days worth. The station around the moon has uh, 707 days worth, uh, though that's just with one crew. The, it's got an equivalent amount to the emergency habitat, which has two crew. So we're, we're pretty well provisioned. The rescue pod with one crew in it has 74 days worth. And then the, the Kerbin Station Corps has uh, one crew with 712 days worth. So uh, provision-wise, we're okay. And actually, that was one of the purposes of the Sparrow. So the Sparrow 2, or the Rocker 1, if you will. Um, its goal is going to be to send the supplies because we don't need a huge rocket like this to send the supplies. Uh, something that can launch 2.8 tons to the moon is quite sufficient to send the supplies that we might need and so that's the purpose of the Sparrow. John Gas is all nice and confident. I'm gonna drop the fairings now. Now? There we go. Oh, I didn't really want to run out of fuel. Tarn. That's uh, I wanted to reserve some fuel in order to deorbit. Okay, well, there's got to be a rough, rough recovery if we can do it at all. All right. Okay, it saved that one. And uh, let's activate this engine and continue. Okay, John Gas is safely in orbit, but the tricky part for me is to see where this can be brought back down safely without any fuel. I, I doubt it, but let's find out. Okay, well, that's the end of the Delta V for this thing. Vessel mass 40 tons, you know. It's not a light vehicle by any stretch of the imagination. We've got some torque. And I guess we better use it now. Oh, that's not really the direction I wanted you to go in, Smart ASS. Now, if I could figure out which way to orient to prevent uh, overheating of the parachutes, that would be a good idea. But then which is going to overheat more? The inflatable, these uh, little uh, flotation devices, or or the parachutes? I think uh, last time we uh, tried to, when we tried to re-enter from orbit with this, there was uh, these little inflatables that uh, that actually had the biggest problem. We've got pretty high apoapsis this time too. Oh, we're gonna miss the. We're actually um, going further than we normally do with this too. We're overshooting the peninsula. Well, maybe not overshooting. Maybe we'll actually land on it. That's gonna be horrible. Not again. Not land. I was trying not to hit land, and now look at it. It's aiming us right at it. Uh, maybe we'll head on over. Yeah, I think we'll be all right. Okay, I don't think I need Smarty SS to keep us retrograde anymore, but I want a little bit of a spin here to have differential heating. Make sure that uh, it's not just the parachute or parachutes or the or the flotation devices getting all the heat. I'm 
sort of roasting on a spit kind of thing. So yeah, I'm actually manually rolling this. It's not rolling on its own. Oh, oh, something exploded. I don't know what exploded though. Probably a flotation device. Probably the... Wow, 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 wow. Those flotation... Okay, I can't even roll it anymore. I don't have any control to roll this. The flotation devices have horrible heat shielding. They're worse than the parachutes. But, uh, well, I mean, we lost these, it looks like. Okay, mock effects. G-forces. Let me just quickly check. Uh, it was just the uh, curb... Pro oh, yeah, the camera, right. Uh, I, I should just remove the camera. I don't use it very much. Maybe it uh, also conducts heat to other things. And then the flotation devices. I'm going to have to go back to the airbags. I don't know if the airbags that we used previously before I upgraded stuff uh, have had their heat tolerances tweaked. I might have to manually tweak the heat tolerances on these flotation devices. There's no reason. Why would you even have them if they can't do... If they can't be retained through... Well, this is a minor heating. Come on. Okay, uh, first volley of parachutes. Okay, second volley of parachutes. We're on one click now. It definitely does not require two clicks to get these parachutes out. Okay, full parachute deployment. Eek. Flotation devices, whatever is left of them. Might as well use them. Uh, we're at uh, 7 meters per second, let's call it. Not exactly sure how to place the flotation devices, mind you. Still ripped, uh, ripped apart the important end. Uh, though we can recover this end. It's got the controller and this entire these tanks. Funny the the part with more flotation devices seems to have uh, have been wrecked, whereas the one with fewer seems to have survived. Hmm. Uh, now, of course, flotation devices I guess should be on top. But then again, I have a balance problem because I needed something to counterbalance the parachutes, right? Because the parachutes have a lot of mass on one side of the the thing, and I wanted something to counterbalance them, and that's why I had the airbags initially and then the flotation devices. But technically, the flotation devices should be on top of the vehicle, I think. Maybe. Anyway, let's just recover this part. Uh, yeah, and then uh, I think... Uh, after we recover this, FMRS will jump us back to the mission. Okay, so FMRS didn't actually return me to the vessel. It actually crashed the game. I started up the save again, and now uh, when I went to the space center, you know, at the beginning of uh, of the game, uh, it, it now it turned me immediately to this vessel. It didn't even uh, I didn't have to go to the tracking station or anything. It immediately brought me to this vessel. Uh, does it say that it recovered that? No. So the little thing that I told it to recover, I don't think it actually recovered it. That's fine. I, I don't think... Uh, it, w it wasn't a successful uh, result anyway. As long as John Gas is in, uh, in... As long as John Gas doesn't have to be relaunched, let's say. What the heck is going on here? I think that was the burn that we did to make orbit, but uh, it looks like FMRS is a little bit behind the times on this. I hope it hasn't messed up anything else. Again, I zipped up the save after the light tower was uh, deployed, and it looks like it's still over there. So yeah, uh, because of the two restarts, uh, the game crashed twice in this during the course of this episode. I'm running a little bit short on time, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to get this module in orbit around the moon and then we'll have to wait until the next episode to actually land it using the pumpkin 
and uh, probably this would be too long an episode anyway if I tried to get it to uh, get it to the ground within uh, within this episode. So it'll be all right. Uh, so next episode we'll start off by getting John Gas to the surface, and then after doing that, we should try and bring our colony modules. So we we'll have the colony control center there as well as this Kerbitat and we should try and connect them together uh, close to the light tower obviously then I want to uh, see about uh, maybe bringing the carbonite miner back up to the station though we don't have any carbonite containment facilities at the station I don't think so we need to have uh, but yeah so we'll send uh, some sort of carbonite converter and uh, containment unit to the station around the moon so that it can do the carbonite uh, conversions on its own and maybe it should have small carbonite mining drones instead of having a large carbonite miner I'll think about that so maybe I'll design some of that sort of thing uh, the, the larger carbonite miners might not be the most efficient thing I forget what what the limiting factor was I think it's the conversion unit the thing that converts carbonite to liquid fuel and oxidizer but maybe if we can uh, anyway, I'll, I'll take a look and see what I can do. Okay, there we go. Now we do have to rendezvous with the pumpkin, so I'm going to be wanting to make sure that our inclination is right and all of that once we get into the Moon or Sphere of Influence. But we've got some time. Let's get over there. Uh, I didn't really have a waste sump for these things or some way of getting rid of waste. Uh, now I understand that the waste uh, just gets dumped overboard if uh, it fills up, but uh, with uh, carbon dioxide being such a big thing on Apollo 13, I think it would be a good idea to sort of simulate that fact by actually trying to scrub it out. But since I forgot at this time, I, I guess I can't... Uh, do anything about that now. Now, oh yes, Haystack plugin. There are all sorts of mods that I would like to add to this, <laughs> and I have to remember to do that at some point. Um, pumpkin, yes, set us target. Okay, lunar orbit insertion complete. We're at uh, 354 by 30 orbit and that'll probably make it easier for us to match up with the with the target but uh, we won't do that right now I'll see that for the next episode so yeah uh, with that uh, with a light tower at our base uh, Kerbitat getting ready to be landed on the surface of the of the moon and of course uh, a reasonably successful test of the sparrow launcher which will be able to launch supplies quickly to the moon. I think uh, I think we've accomplished some significant things in this episode. So thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.